Welcome back to our Sabbath school. This is lesson number 12, a worship that never ends. You know, have you ever been sick and missed church? Or think about the COVID experiences where some churches were closed and uh, you missed for a number of weeks. How did you feel about that? You may have watched online, but you still, there was something missing, wasn't there? I don't think you can duplicate the experience of getting together with our brothers and sisters, singing the songs of heaven, praying together, listening to the word of God together, hearing those amens, or praise the Lord, fellowshipping after service, maybe staying for a fellowship meal, that there's something about corporate worship that inspires the heart, that lifts the spirits, that leads us closer to the Savior. Now, there are times, of course, when people are sick and they can't make it to church or times when the elderly cannot make it. And I think at those times for church members to visit, to share the blessings of, of, of heaven, we are going to look this week at uh, Lesson 12, Worship That Never Ends. Our memory text is Psalm 104, verse 33. Psalm 104, verse 33. And the memory verse says this. Powerful verse. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. I will sing to the Lord as what? As long as I live. We were made as worshiping beings. We were made to praise God, made to give him thanksgiving. You know, we did not choose to live. We were brought into existence by a God that loves us, that cares for us, by a God that has a purpose for our life. In our Sabbath afternoon's lesson, uh, the last paragraph on the page brings out a beautiful thought about, about praising God. It says, Praising the Lord in the congregation is perceived as ideal worship. This does not mean that prayer and praise of the individual in Israel assume a secondary meaning. By contrast, the individual's worship of God feeds the communal worship with renewed praise, while in turn individual worship develops its fullest potential in close relationship with the community. There's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Individual worship finds its fullest potential in close relationship with the community as we worship together corporately as we come to church every sabbath and praise god it fills our hearts with such love and grace it fills our hearts with such a sense of his presence that throughout the week our individual worship is fueled inspired, encouraged, deepened by what happened on Sabbath. Sunday's lesson is entitled, Lift Up Your Hands to the Sanctuary. So what do we see there in Psalm 134? Well, what, what do we find in Psalm 134 about worship, praise? Let's look at some of the words that are used in Psalm 134. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. So one thing we're seeing is bless the Lord. What does it mean to bless the Lord? Jesus has everything except my worship. My worship must be voluntary. You know, Psalm says the silver and gold is, or Haggai says the silver and gold is mine, says the Lord. Psalm says that uh, the beasts of the forest are his, the cattle on 10,000 hills are his, he owns the world. Psalm 19, 19, one, Psalm 19 the, the earth is the Lord's and all the fullness in it. He has everything. But he doesn't have our worship unless we give it to him voluntarily. So what does it mean to bless the Lord? It means that we come praising his name because of his goodness and grace and mercy toward us. Bless the Lord, Psalm 134. Verse 1, bless the Lord, all you his servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. 
What is this idea of lifting up your hands? What's, what's that represent? It represents, it's the expression of giving him the fullness of my being, giving him everything that I have. It's the idea of empty hands, of sacrifice, surrender, commitment, dedication. That's the idea here behind this. And Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. So we bless the Lord by worshiping him because we give to him that which he does not have unless we voluntarily offer it. And um, if you look at Psalm 18, Psalm 36, Psalm 113, you find those in Sunday's lesson. They're talking about all the different results of blessing the Lord. And uh, when we bless or, pray or praise God, our hearts are not filled with fear. When we bless or praise God, we are blessed. When we bless or praise God, we, our hearts are filled with love. For example, let me give you a couple examples of this in uh, Sunday's lesson, Psalm 18. You're going to look there at verse 1. Psalm 18, verse 1. I will love you, Lord, O Lord, my strength. The Lord's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I'll trust, my shield that protects me, the horn of my salvation. The horn is the strength, the power, my stronghold. See, look, I love the Lord. I love you, Lord. O Lord, my strength. So true worship comes as I love him, as I come and say, Lord, you've been so good to me. I give you all my affection. I give you my love. And as I do that, my heart then responds to his love in an open way, and I receive more love from him. The more I love Jesus, the more his love flows into my heart. You know, the Bible says John was the disciple Jesus loved. What does that mean? Does it mean Jesus was partial? He loved John more than he loved Peter or, or, or James? Not at all. John was the disciple that Jesus loved because John's heart was open to receive more love. So 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. So God is love. But the more my heart expands to worship him, and the more I open my heart to praise him, the more I give him thanksgiving, the more I have the capacity to love him, and the larger my bucket becomes to receive the showers of his love in my life, the more I can, I can receive that love. John was the disciple that Jesus loved because John had the capacity to receive more love. Um, Monday's lesson talks about a new song. You find that throughout the Bible. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 3. What's this new song all about? Psalm 33, verse 3. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. What, what's, a, what's a new song? Psalm, Psalm 40 verse 3. It's repeated repeatedly through the Psalms. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. What is this new song that God puts in our mouth? Psalm 96 verse 1. All through the scripture you find this concept of a new song and I want to develop that with you for a few moments. Psalm 96 verse 1. One, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Again, you find it in Psalm 98, Psalm 144. What is this singing a new song? It's a fresh res recognition of the Lord's majesty, his sovereignty over the world. It's uh, the new song of gratitude for its care and salvation as creator, redeemer, judge, what is this new song? It's a new recognition of his grace, his goodness, and his glory. Now, not only do the Psalms mention this new song, but you find it in Isaiah 42, verse 10 to 12. Psalm, Proverbs, Isaiah 42, verse 10 to 12. You find this new song there as well. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and you inhabitants of them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice. The villages of Kedar, let 
the inhabitants of Sila sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise. So what is this new song about? It's the song of the knowledge of Christ, the song of the goodness of Christ, the song of the redemption of Christ, the song of the power of Christ, the song of the hope that we have in Christ. The new song has to do with a new experience with Jesus who changes our lives, who transforms us into the image of the living God. In Psalm 43, verse 19, rather Isaiah 43, we've been in Psalms so much, my mind is locked there. Isaiah 43, verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall bring forth. Shall you not know it? I'll even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will do a new thing. The new song is the new thing. God wants you to sing a new song. He wants you to be so filled with his love, so charmed with his grace, so redeemed by his power, that your heart is just filled with his love, and in your life you sing a new song. There's a sparkle in your eyes, a smile on your face. You radiate his love and goodness, and in Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, you sing the new song. He's saying, the new song is the new thing I want to do in your life. I don't want you to have a formal religion. I don't want you to have worship just because it's some legalistic requirement. I don't want your life to be filled with rituals of worship. But I want to do a new thing in your life. I want you to Christian experience to be warm and fresh and new and vital. I will do a new thing. Revelation 5, verse 9. The book of Revelation talks about this new song in two separate places at least. Revelation, the fifth chapter. And we'll look there at the ninth verse. Revelation 5 and verse 9. They sang a new song. What was the new song that they sang? Now John is this vision of heaven, this vision of eternity. They sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain. You redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on earth. We're kings, we're priests of God. Kings, we have royal blood flowing in our veins. Jesus has taken us from the guttermost to the uttermost, from the depths of despair to the delights of discipleship. He's made us kings. We're part of the royal family of God. Princes and princes to sit with him forever. He, and then it says, he's made us priests. We represent him on earth. We sing the new song of his grace, of his good. What is that news of his goodness? What's the new song? You were slain and redeemed us to God by your blood. That's his new song. Revelation 14, verse 3. There's a group called the 144,000. Who are these 144,000? They are men and women who have been redeemed from the earth. And what does the Bible say? They sang a new song. They sang a new song. It is the song of their unique experience. They've gone through the time of Jacob's trouble. They've gone through a time when there has been no intercessor in the sanctuary above. What does that mean? It means that he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And he that is unholy, let him be unholy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is clean, let him be clean still. What does it mean there's no mediator in heaven's sanctuary? It means that Christ's work as a mediator for sin is over. That the people of God have sealed their eternal destiny. The Holy Spirit has sealed them. Their destiny is sealed. They are in Christ, justified by Christ, sanctified by Christ. Their total life is committed to Christ. They cannot be moved. They've made their final irrevocable decision sealed by the Spirit. What about those who haven't been sealed by the Spirit? They've rebelled against Christ, turned their back on his teaching, 
they are they have received the mark of the beast so the work of redemption is over the holy spirit has made his final appeal so there's no need now for the specific intercessory work in heaven's sanctuary as far as redemption and the atonement for sin is concerned does that mean that jesus has left his people to live through the time of trouble in their own strength not at all does it mean that the time of trouble is a time we have to clench our fists and grip our teeth and say, I have to be so righteous, so perfect, that, that I'll make it of it? Not at all. Jesus, we may not sense his presence. We may not feel his presence. It's like on the cross, when Jesus was there, there may be apparently darkness all around us. But I love the song, Just When I Need Him, Jesus is Near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, just when I need him most. Christ will never leave me. Christ will will never forsake me. He says, Lo, I'm with you always until the ends of the earth. Although his redemptive work to save sinners on earth is over because everybody's already made their decision, his presence is still with us. His grace is still reaching out to us. His love is still surrounding us. He enfolds us in those arms of love. And what's this new song? We go through a unique experience in that time of trouble. We trust him. We hold on by faith. And in heaven, the 144,000 sing the unique song of their experience of praising God for his faithfulness in the time of trouble that they've gone through. Praising God that he's, they've, he's never left them. Praising God that by faith they were able to cling to him. And they overcame in the midst of the greatest trial that humanity has ever faced as a corporate whole. Now, I love what it's put, the, uh, the uh, last paragraph on Monday's lesson. A new song can depict a fresh song that no one has ever heard before. A song that commemorates a vivid experience of God's grace in one's life. The new song can also express hope, in which case the newness of the song is demonstrated in anticipation of the unique, unprecedented experience of God's majesty in the future. True worship goes beyond sacrifices and offerings and reflects a living relationship with God that's always fresh and dynamic. In a sense, one could simply say that the new song is a new expression even each day, of our love and appreciation for what God has done for us. In other words, like it says in Lamentations, you know, God's mercies are new every morning. So what's the new song? It's the new experience that Jesus gives with us every day. And what is that new song that the 144,000 will sing? It's the song of their experience, the experience of trust in trial that has taken them through the time of trouble. Now, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Psalm 15. Who can abide in his tabernacle? On Tuesday's lesson, if you're following with your quarterly, Tuesday's lesson, we're looking at Psalm 15. And uh, this is quite a, quite a description in Psalm 15. Short psalm, only five verses. Not like Psalm 119 with 165 some odd verses. Um, the question is raised, Psalm 15, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Then it tells you, he who walks uprightly, he who works righteousness, who speaks truth in his heart. What does it mean to walk uprightly? It means to live a life of integrity. It means to live a life of honesty. And works righteousness, a person who is kind and compassionate and lives a righteous, godly life who speaks the truth in his heart, who's totally transparent. There is no guile, no lying, no duplicity there, no dishonesty there. He doesn't backbite with his tongue. He's not critical of others. He doesn't do evil to his neighbor. He doesn't take up a reproach against a friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. In other words, he distinguishes between truth and error. He distinguishes between right and wrong. And he's not going to be um, praising the vileness and the lewdness and the impurity 
and the moral defilement of this world. He's going to uphold righteousness. Notice, he does not put out his money at usury. In other words, he's not lending all these people money and then charging some high interest. Notice, he take a bribe against the innocent. He does. He who does these things shall never be moved. The lesson has a very, very powerful section on what this means. Um, it's the last uh, paragraph under Tuesday's lesson. A perfect heart, and where's that coming from? We probably should read that. Psalm 24, verse 3 to 6. Psalm 24, verse 3 to 6. We're combining really the three psalms here. Uh, Psalm 15, Psalm 24, and Psalm 101. But uh, Psalm 24, verse 3 to 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Psalm 24, verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. So who's going to ascend into God's holy hill? Who's going to stand in his holy place? Clean hands, pure heart. He's not worshipped the idols of this world. And um, you notice Psalm 101, verse 1 to 3. Psalm 101, verse 1 to 3. So looking at three Psalms, Psalm 15, Psalm 24, Psalm 101. Uh, verse, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I'll sing praises. I'll behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I'll walk within my house with a perfect heart. I'll set nothing wicked before my eyes. Just, I will hate, I will hate the work of all those who fall away. Notice I'll set nothing wicked before my eyes. Those who are preparing for the coming of Jesus are not going to be sitting before their TV watching movies that are filled with murder, horror movies, that which flaunts immorality. That's not going to be in their mind, in their heart. I'll set before me nothing that... Uh, Wicked before my eyes. I'll behave wisely in a perfect way. I'll walk within my house with a perfect heart. What is this perfect heart? Sometimes there are those who talk about perfection. What do we mean? What does the Bible mean when it talks about a perfect heart? Does that mean that um, we'll never fail? <laughs> never make a mistake? What does it mean? I like the way the author puts it here. A perfect heart is the worshiper's greatest quality before God. The word, the Hebrew word timim, perfect, conveys the notion of completeness and wholeness. A perfect vine is whole, undamaged and healthy. Animals offered as sacrifices had to be timid or without blemish. Perfect speech is entirely truthful. A perfect heart is a pure heart, a heart of integrity, a heart that seeks God. A heart that's restored by God's forgiveness. A blameless life springs from the acknowledgement of God's grace and his righteousness. Divine grace inspires and enables God's servants to live in the fear of the Lord, which means to live in the unhindered fellowship with God and in submission to his word. What's a perfect heart? A perfect heart is an undivided heart. A perfect heart is a heart that longs for Christ. A perfect heart is a heart that says, Jesus, all I am and all I have, I surrender to you. That's what a perfect heart is all about. It um, is a heart that is one with God's heart that says, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. And those who have this commitment to God, who have this spirit of worship, who have this uh, uh, desire to serve God and to praise him, they will declare his glory among the nations. Psalm 96, what manifold aspects of worship are mentioned in this psalm? So let's look at Psalm 96. What aspects of worship are mentioned here? We find a number of aspects of worship mentioned in Psalm 96. We start with verse 1, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Hey, here's that new song again. God wants to give you, me, a new experience with him in the things of eternity. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. 
declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. Wow. True worship has to do with declaring God's glory. True worship has to do with declaring God's praise. I come to worship. But worship does not end on Sabbath morning when I leave the church. Worship has to do with praising God on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday in my lifestyle. I don't have to be walking around saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord every second. Not at all. But I have this sense that life is a gift, that every day is a new experience with Jesus. And I live a life of thanksgiving, a life of praise. And from that life overflows the desire to share with others the goodness of his grace, the greatness of his power, the majesty of his love. And so when we leave church on Sabbath and go out again to the common, ordinary jobs that we have, the professions that we have, or as students go back to school, we're looking for opportunities, praying for divine appointments to reveal God's grace and God's glory with others. Um, it says here in the lesson, worship springs from the inward recognition of who the Lord is, that he's creator, king, and judge. Worship thus involves remembering God's past acts, creation, celebrating his present wonders. God sustains the world in his present reign and anticipating his future deeds and end time judgment and a new life in a new heavens and a new earth. And when we are so committed to this Christ that he created us, that we're not specks of cosmic dust, we're not some genetic accident, not simply skin covering bone, but we're created by God. When we have that sense, when we have the sense that, that he plunged into this snake pit of the world and redeemed us, justifies by us by his blood, cleanses us by his power, when, when we have that sense, and when we have the sense that he's coming again, and that fills our heart every week as we worship him, and as we learn to sing the new song, the song of his glory and grace. We want to share that glory, share that grace that he's given us with others so we become his witnesses in the world. Uh, look at verse 10 of Psalm 96. Psalm verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge his peoples rightly. Say among the nations, David found something so good, so large, so great. He found a God of might and majesty, a sovereign God who was in control even when the world seemed to be out of control. But all he could do was say, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. That's our, that's our message. The Lord reigns. This world is not chaotically out of control, but the Lord reigns. This world is not headed on collision course to disaster. No nuclear war is going to blow this world apart as some spinning globe of ash. But the Lord reigns, and he's going to set all things right. When God does not delight in sacrifices, Thursday's lesson, formal worship does not please God. Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. You'll notice it here. If you have your Bible, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. God is not interested, as we mentioned earlier, in formal ritualistic worship. He's not interested for us to simply come and say, Look, look at, uh, look at how much money I gave to the church. Not interested in that. If we give out of a generous heart, God be praised. Oh, but look, God, I kept Sabbath perfectly. I did, did not sin at all. You know, I, I look at what I did, Lord. No. Lord, I kept my body in perfect health. Well, praise God if you did that. It's a wonderful thing to do. 
But look, we are not faithful in our tithe to earn his righteousness or his love. We're not faithful in keeping the Sabbath to earn his righteousness or in his love. We're not faithful in our health to earn his righteousness in our, or his love. We return our tithe to God because of a deep sense of gratitude to him because he loved us so much. We observe the Sabbath because we long to be in his presence and fellowship with him. We keep our bodies in good health because we don't want to disappoint our Creator, because we long to have clear minds to think the thoughts of heaven. We long to keep our bodies in health because we want to be powerful witnesses for Him. In an age of sickness and suffering, we want our bodies to be in good health, to testify that the principles He gave us work in the real world. So we don't come with some legalistic, ritualistic attempt to please him. We come because of what he's done for us, is doing for us, and will continue to do for us. We come praising his name, honoring him, worshiping him, worshiping him in spirit and worshiping him in truth. That's what Scripture says. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. To worship Him in spirit means to worship Him with your whole heart, your whole life, your whole being. To worship Him in truth means you worship Him in harmony with Scripture. Would you like to open your heart? Say, Jesus, I want to come to you with a perfect heart. I want you to cleanse me of all self, any taint of sin, Anything that's in me that's not in harmony with your will, Lord, cleanse it. And I long, Lord, in addition to that, to sing a new song. To day by day have a new experience with you. An experience of freshness. An experience in prayer. Experience in your word. Psalm, this lesson, lesson 12 in the Psalms, is calling us to sing a new song. It's calling us to have a new experience. It's calling us to experience a vitality and a freshness in our Christian life. Let's open our hearts for that as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you call us to have undivided hearts. Thank you that you call us to sing a new song of your love in Jesus' name. Amen.